Natalie was the one who told her about the wishing pool, which was midway between their properties, nestled between two ancient live oaks that bent toward each other as if to hug. It was more like a puddle than a pool, Joy had always thought, maybe six feet across, so shallow that the green-brown water only reached their knees, although Natalie cautioned against ever touching the water. It's for wishes, Natalie said. Touching the water ruins them. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is the ninth episode of Season 7, and today we are continuing our discussion of another master of horror and one of our podcast favorites, Renata Reeve Do. So join us as we talk about one of her short stories, The Wishing Pool. So as Lisa mentioned, this particular season, we've been doing a lot of Master of Horror episodes, which we've done a few in the past. And that's where we focus on someone who is uh, pretty well known in the horror genre, whose who's work that we like. And uh, our latest Master of Horror we have been discussing is Tananari Do. So if you want more general information about Dew's career and some of our favorite books that she's written, check out our last episode. If you've listened to the last episode, then you're going to get a little bit more about Tanana Reeve Dew's work because today, as Lisa mentioned, we are talking about one of her short stories, The Wishing Pool. Now, listeners, you can find this story um, online. This story is from 2021, and it was published in um, Uncanny Magazine and also read on their podcast. So if you search for The the Wishing Pool and Tanana Reeve Dew's name, it will take you to the Uncanny Magazine printing of the story. The other thing that I wanted to mention in this intro part before we get into the story is that Dew has a new book coming out pretty soon. She actually has two new books coming out this year. On April 18th, her, I guess it would be her second short story collection, but her first new book in seven years, uh, The Wishing Pool and other stories will be out. I am assuming that since a lot of the stories in this collection, there are going to be new stories in it, but there are several stories in it that have been published elsewhere. I'm assuming The Wishing Pool of the title is this story, The Wishing Pool. Um, I am super excited and looking forward to that book. I probably need to go ahead and put in a pre-order for it. And then I also just wanted to throw out there, because I don't think we mentioned it in our episode on her in general, that her book, The Reformatory, comes out later this year, I believe on October 31st, which if it sticks with that date, is such a perfect date for a horror book to come out on. So I guess I'll start us out with just a very brief summary of the story. I'm not going to go through all the detail, but just a general idea, listeners. So if you decide to wait to read the story, um, or if you don't mind getting spoilers first and you listen to the episode, you'll at least kind of get a gist for what we're going to be talking about. So the wishing pool follows the character of Joy, and uh, we're we're focused on Joy in this story, but she also has a brother, Jesse, and they are dealing with an aging parent. So their mother has passed away prior to the story, and their father's taking it hard and also having memory issues. And he doesn't want to be in the house alone, and so he's taken to basically living in this cabin they used to use for vacations. And while Joy is going to the cabin to see her father and see how he's doing and th- th- so she can talk to her brother about what to do to help him, she starts remembering a friend of hers named Natalie who would be in a nearby cabin. And when they were kids, they would play together. Natalie showed her this kind of almost pooly, pooling puddle on the ground, basically, that she called the wishing pool because she said if you threw a penny in and made a wish, it would come true. The children make wishes and the wishes are not perfect, I guess you would say, and are kind of disturbing because this is this is horror. And then this, the story kind of ends with Joy dealing with this temptation of a wishing pool as an adult in her current situation. I've read The Wishing Pool now, I think, three times. I guess it was like, um, uh, 
this was very recently. I was teaching a class and I was thinking about teaching one of Dew's stories. I ended up doing Patient Zero, but I was looking at what was available online in different magazines and The Wishing Pool was one that popped up and I read it. And like I said, I decided to go with Patient Zero, but The Wishing Pool was a close second because I'll just talk about a couple of the things I found fascinating about it. One, I think it really catches the feel, unfortunately, of what it's like to be in this situation with an elderly family member going through a difficult situation, and which is the real life existential horror. And then there's the internal becoming external with the wishing pool, taking one's wishes, but not necessarily doing maybe what one wants. And I've said before, I think here on this podcast, but also in a recent episode, Lisa and I did on her book, The Between for the Monster Shirt podcast, that one of the things Do does really well is dealing with different forms of horror, usually kind of an external force and an internal force at the same time. And I don't think the story is any different. It, the story itself has supernatural aspects, but it's definitely dealing again, with kind of real life fears of each age um, of this character and the things that she's dealing with. So that's a little summary of the story itself and some of my thoughts on it. Lisa, Matt, was uh, this your first encounter with The Wishing Pool? And what were some of your impressions? Yeah, this was my first time reading The Wishing Pool. And I read, um, I don't know if I haven't read a lot of her short stories, but I've read quite a few of them. And, you know, sometimes I think it's really difficult for a writer to excel at both novels and short stories because they feel like very different forms to me in, in the way you like tell the story. And so I've read writers who I feel like, for instance, like their novels are really great, but their short stories aren't or vice versa. And in fact, maybe the only like people that I can really just, and this is just off my head, but like Stephen King does really well at both. Paul Tremblay does well at both. Daphne du Maurier, I think really does well at both. Shirley Jackson and then Tanana Reeve do like, I mean, it really takes, I think a certain type of talent to be able to nail both forms of storytelling. So I know anytime I pick up one of Dew's short stories that I'm in for a treat, and this one did not disappoint. And the thing that really surprises me about her work is that there were so many touchstones in the story that reminded me I was reading a Dew horror story, right? Like there was the Florida setting, which in this case was a very specific setting of North Florida that I have driven through a lot. <laughs> I lived not too far from I-10 for a long time, not in Florida, uh, but in Mississippi. And I remember just driving that road, con especially when the hurricanes would come, because we would usually either go north or sometimes we would drive towards Florida, depending on which way the hurricane was going. And I feel like when she talks about like the overpriced Hampton off I-10 or the red dirt path with the gaps between the live oaks with the Spanish moss and these, these places that really feel like you've stepped off of civilization because that particular part of North Florida to me really does feel like that. Like if you get off the interstate or away from some of the towns, it very quickly feels like you've just stepped outside of civilization. So like that evoked a very specific setting to me right away. And then she's also so great at writing family dynamics. I've, I've talked about that in her novels before, especially in The Good House and The Between. But this is the same thing. Like she really creates, and, and this is not a long story. It, it's 4,000 words, just over 4,000 words. So it's not a long story by any means, but she's able to make these characters feel so completely real and their family dynamics. And really we only see 
see kind of in air quotes on the page joy and her father but there's mention of other characters she talks about her brother who she you know talks to her mom who has passed away and then like her friend and her friend's family that she had from childhood so she has all these kind of the world is populated but these characters feel so real and i immediately feel empathetic for what they're going through like this idea of not only grieving the loss of their mother but their father aging in in this case he has an illness he's thin he's not taking care of himself and he's got this diagnosis of dementia which all of this is so relatable i think to people i mean especially like of our age like that's just something that everybody has to kind of confront at some point that like their parents or the people who used to be your caretakers are aging and now those roles have shifted so it's a very like grounded story premise i think but and I, and she does that in other in other of her works too but the thing that's so remarkable about this is all of her short stories also feel very different to me <laughs> Like they're all tackling, like sometimes it's a kid going ghost hunting or it's um, like a pandemic post-apocalyptic type story. And then there's this one, which is, I mean, I don't, it, it deals with wishes. So it's kind of a monkey's paw type situation, but I don't know. Like it's just, I'm in awe of, of her talent to be able to like really just tell such great stories, but that the, each one of them feels so different to me. It's, it's a wonderful thing to experience as a reader. Well, I completely agree with what you're both saying, but I, well, I guess to, to back up, <laughs> to answer your first question, Mel, this was, uh, this was also my first time reading this story. I, I had not read it before. I did end up reading it twice to prepare for the podcast once kind of for initial impressions. And then I went back and reread it a day later, just to kind of revisit it. But but yeah, Lisa, what you were saying about the talent that it takes to be so good at both short stories and longer form fiction like novels, I mean, I, I, I agree that those really do feel like two separate talents, if you will. I mean, obviously both are creative writing, but the the short story and even the novella by nature of it being so much shorter is is almost a different beast in some ways and i was pretty floored by exactly what you were pointing out how fully realized these characters felt in such a short amount of space i mean four thousand words is tiny <laughs> for a short story i mean we're talking like maybe 12 pages if you were to print it out on uh, eight and a half by 11 paper. So, I mean, that, that's not a long story by any means. And, and I think that part of how they felt so fleshed out was because she did focus in so closely on really just two main characters with others kind of coming and going almost a, in kind of Joy's mind, if you will. But I mean, just to, to be able to give you such an insight into a character's thoughts and motivations and and inner workings in such a short amount of time is is quite frankly really impressive. I mean, I, I I've really been stunned by a lot of stuff of hers that I've read, but this one in particular, just the the depth that it got to in such a short amount of space was was really really impressive and I, I i don't know how much we should say spoiler alerts with talking about this because i feel like we do have to kind of talk about the entire story but as i was reading this i felt like there were there were two things going on mel you mentioned that that kind of existential dread the 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 fear of of watching a parent get older and age and become less and less the person they were due to either you know physical weakness or in this case mental weakness as well um, a bit of dementia as well as some if i recall correctly unexplained but some sort of very serious lung condition um, I, I presumed cancer but i don't think 
the word cancer was ever actually said outright, if I remember it right. But on top of that, you've also got this entire trope of the wishing pool, which really is, and this is why I, I kind of wanted to mention, spoiler alert, those of you that are wanting to read this, uh, I will post a link to the article, or the short story, in the show notes, the, the exact same one that we used to read this. Uh, so if, if you do want to go read it, pause now, then come back after you've read it. But I mean, this, even from the beginning, I could tell kind of where it was going. I felt like, oh, this is, this is a play on the monkey's paw trope. And even knowing what it probably was the first time I read it, I still was just really impressed with how well she drew it out and tied those two themes together so very well so that you're dealing not just with the existential horror of, of watching a parent age and decline, but also the the real horror of these these wishes that seem to be granted, but not, not quite in the exact way that was asked for. And when we get to sort of the climax, I kind of kind of knew what was going to happen, but I couldn't completely predict it. And then when we when we finished the the story, I, I said, wow, I mean that was even knowing what was probably going to happen, it still hit me like kind of a gut punch because it was just so sad. And I, I am being slightly vague here because I, I, I want to give us a little more room to discuss. We're still doing opening impressions here. But yeah, I just overall, I, I was just really, really impressed by this story. Yeah, I agree with uh, with what you guys are saying about it. I, as you were talking, I could only nod because I, I totally agree that her mastery of novels and short stories and family dynamics and character de character development are all excellent. I mean, I was struck by that again when I was rereading the story for this episode is that when I thought back on the story, I thought it was longer than this because when I was thinking back on it, I was just struck by the relationships that we get. I mean, literally joy is kind of driving in her car and having memories as you mentioned matt and that, that gives us a lot of like the character development but then just the inner the brief interaction uh, well, i guess it, i don't know brief maybe is not the right word but it's not very long before her father goes to bed but she gets there and they're not together very long talking until he gets tired and has to go to bed. Um, she gets a feel for the fact that this is a pretty bad situation that, you know, she's, she's debating taking him to a hospital or something like not leaving him in the cabin. But the thing that I thought was really remarkable this time around is like how I had a, kind of remembered it as this a little bit more like information about the parents but reading it this time, I was like, oh, we really don't see the mom much at all, except like a couple of times when they're kids, the parents come when they need them. The information that we get is from the conversation between Joy and her father, because he's for, he thinks he's forgetting things about his wife, which is so painful and so hard to read. And she finds out that she supplies information with the mother's name, which the mother's first name is the same name as Deuce, mother's first name. But she provides a name and she, you know, she's telling him different details. It's really not that much, but it paints such a picture of this, these close family dynamics. Um, even just mentions of when they would get in trouble when they were kids, that gives even more pictures. Like I, the details that she provides are just the ones to make me think later on that I like knew these people so much better than I actually did. And I have to say, too, like just personally, having gone through witnessing what um, conditions like dementia can do to my grandparents, I, you know, witnessed a, a grandparent keeping a notebook to write stuff down in every time they remembered. And uh, it just it really hit me hard when I got to the part where her father has been keeping the notebook to remember his birth date and to remember names and his grandkids names and things like that, because just the details what was going on it's not a whole lot but it's enough that you totally get the picture and I just I think that's an interesting it's a short story a very short short story but it's powerful enough that you kind of when you think back on it you remember way more than that was actually on the page 
And I like the way the wishing pool was introduced too. Matt, you were talking about how the, it kind of reminded you of the monkey's paw type situation, but then it, it's just, it makes perfect sense why adult Joy <laughs> would go to the wishing pool, even though she doesn't know if she believes if it's real or not, because of the uncanny and disturbing experiences that she had with it when she was a kid. And so we not only get Joy in this moment trying to get to her father and help him, but we get to learn about Joy's kind of journey to this point and like what she was like as a kid even. I, Natalie and her family are barely in the story, but you feel like you know so much more about them too. So yeah, I mean, the, the character development in this story and the strategic placement of the details, because there's not that many, so you've got to put them in certain ways to kind of paint a picture. It's... Yeah, I mean, I just, I feel like I'm just agreeing with you guys, but everything from setting to character to dynamics to even the horror themes of it just work so well. It's like clockwork, basically. I feel like we're all three just making a case for why we're talking about Do as part of our <laughs> Master of Horror series, because... I mean, she really does just have a mastery over all of these things. But I do think, since this is a horror podcast, uh, that we do need to talk a little bit about the wishing pool aspect of it. Because that's where the kind of, if you want to call it like a supernatural horror element of it lives. Obviously, there's a lot of real world horror in this, as there is in a lot of Dew's work you know, we've mentioned like the grief and the dementia, which I, I agree with you, Mel, that part was really hard for me to read and really heartbreaking having experienced it firsthand. It's, it's something that is just devastating. And so to kind of see somebody on the page struggling like that, and to know that joy is having to deal with that also makes it incredibly hard but also there's even the cabin itself that they're in becomes like this space of like real world grounded horror because she doesn't want to sleep in the main house and her father hasn't slept in the main house presumably since the mother died a year ago so it's like the main house has all these memories and now he's staying in this cabin but even the cabin itself was built in the 1920s by her great grandfather to hide from the lynch mobs because he was a Negro businessman who could, who could afford a shiny new Ford Model T. That's from like the first, first opening of the story. Like when we, when we're learning about this cabin and, you know, so there's a lot of, that kind of real world horror that's buried underneath everything that's happening. But then we have the supernatural aspect of the wishing pool and listeners as, as Matt alluded for th at this point here be spoilers. So <laughs> just know that that's what we're, what we're going through when she first learns about it, she learns about the wishing pool from Natalie at the time, Natalie and Joy were both 10-year-old girls. They had known each other during these kind of vacations because Natalie's family would come and visit, and they, they lived in a lake house that was only a quarter of a mile. And they had so far come for two summers and two winters, and so Joy and Natalie kind of had this friendship going on, just going through the woods, collecting tadpoles, tracking butterflies, kicking over out maps ant mounds and vengeance whittling figures from fat twigs or smoking cigarettes natalie stole from her mother anything that basically wasn't fishing is what they what she says which again it's those little details that really make you feel like you understand who these girls are but what i find really interesting is that natalie is the one who tells her about it so she tells her about this wishing pool and which again is kind of this like muddy puddle and Natalie says you can't touch the water but you can make a wish but again if you touch the water it's going to ruin your wish so I guess like it won't come true kind of like maybe it's like the childhood lore of like when you blow out your birthday candles at your birthday you make a wish but if you tell somebody it won't come true like there's this idea that somehow you can ruin wishes if you 
do something wrong. But I also find it really, I don't know, I find it really interesting because this happens with a lot of like supernatural horror and it's really effective. We don't know how long the wishing pool has been there. Presumably a long time, but uh, Joy has never seen it before. And it's been somewhere near her property, at least. But my big question was, how does Natalie know about it? And how does she know it's a wishing pool? Like, it, it's it's just one of these things that is almost like I could imagine a child coming across a puddle. And if you're trying to entertain yourself, like, making up a story about it being a wishing pool, right? So it's almost like Natalie spun this story into existence <laughs> but I don't know it's never explained which again I really think helps the horror and then they wish they make their first wish to kind of test it out and they wish for a dog but they she does admit that they didn't really think it through exactly because they didn't know what that would mean to have like jo joint ownership of the dog but a dog does come and they do manage at least for a time to have joint ownership of this dog. And they're convinced they call him lucky. Um, and they're convinced that it was the wishing pool that brought it. But then the dog, just as mysteriously as the dog shows up, the dog goes away. So they say it's because they didn't wish for the dog to stay. Therefore, it didn't, but it's also this idea that if it was a wish doll dog that <laughs> was somehow like conjured up by this magical pool, that maybe the magic will run out at some point. So I don't know. What did you guys think of this kind of supernatural? What was your take on the wishing pool itself? You know, I think it's interesting that you were trying to figure out the origins of the wishing pool. I actually didn't think of that. I just guess I accepted it as this this is going to be a weird supernatural thing, or we're going to have to figure out if it's really supernatural or their thoughts about it. But I really, I kind of, if I thought of anything at all, I probably thought that maybe Natalie tried it before, but I think you're right. There's something almost trap like about the wishing pool on the one hand, it's midway between their properties. It's between the two ancient live oaks that no trails anywhere else, but there seems to be like a bear trail going to that. It's almost like it was tempting them to go there, the kids. But I, I like this idea of Natalie maybe almost dreaming it up and it happened. I cannot remember, this is horrible, but I cannot remember the title of the story that's coming to mind or the person who wrote it, which is bad. And I'm not going to spend time Googling it. But there's a, a, a horror story that I've, I've taught before. It's been many, many years. And there's two kids. And when they walk home from school or from the store or something like that, they go through this one spot that they think is weird and uncanny and haunted. And they think there's a monster there and they like dare each other uh, to go through before it gets them. And he talks about how they hear the noise of the claws and blah, blah. And everything is explainable by what's around them. It's just kids being scared and making up stories to explain their fear. And in the story, he gets older and he realizes that it's just the limbs or the leaves or whatever, but it sure does seem real. And when he goes back home, um, a kid is killed there and everything about it is mysterious and strange and seems like it's related to their monster. And so the idea is if you, if you, if you imagine hard enough or you believe hard enough or you fear hard enough, you can almost like create your own monster. And I like this idea that you have of Natalie almost dreaming this up because Natalie seems much more invested in the wishing pool at first than Joy. Joy just kind of seems to be there. But even though the dog could just be a runaway dog and leave, there were details about the dog that were creeping me out before we ever even got to the second wish, which is really disturbing. Because yes, it's like, oh, we should have said we want a dog to keep. So it's like the lesson of wishing more specifically, right? Because the more and more specific wish is the better, but it never is. But even the way the dog leaves kind of disturbed me a little bit because she, the choice, the word choice, she says that the dog, Lucky had crawled out of her house. And I don't know. I feel like if it's like Lucky ran out of house, Lucky left the house. There's something almost like he became, it's almost like he was sick or something. And I felt like there was a really kind of disturbing 
I was already nervous about this pool. I'll put it that way. And not just because it didn't let them keep the dog. It was almost like Lucky had no time left. And maybe I thought that because Lucky's described very much like my dog. So maybe I was like, no, I don't want the wishing pool dog to go away. Uh, but I was already creeped out. And then when Natalie makes the wish for her parents to get a divorce, because her parents argue so much, we find out later that the reason that Natalie and her parents don't come back to the cabin anymore after that is because they were in a wreck and Natalie's father died. And so there was a split in the family. And so, you know, at the end, before Joy becomes an adult, or when Joy is an adult, she's like, as an adult, Joy has told the story often with a breezy air, never confessing how she walked far of our way to avoid the wishing pool ever since. How maybe it was the wishing pool, not the boredom of fishing that had soured her on visiting the cabin with her parents after she graduated from high school, how the wishing pool had ended her childhood. So, I mean, you could say that these things are happening are just real life things that kids have to deal with, and that ends your childhood and you become an adult. But I do think there's there's an aspect of the supernatural to this, if the wishing pool indeed is like giving them what they wish, but not in exactly the way they wish. The thing happens, but it's not precisely how they wanted. And I, we see that at the end of the story, too, which I know will probably spoil. But Matt, I don't did did you want to add anything to Lisa's thoughts about the creation of the wishing pool? No, I I think you've both actually kind of covered pretty much everything that I had uh, thought thought of regarding that aspect of it. Like Lisa, I did wonder if this is something that does eventually run dry because like Lisa pointed out, each time Jay and Natalie make a wish, it does seem that the pool has gotten smaller. But then again, when she returns to it as an adult, it, it's barely even there. And one could say that maybe that's just because it's been shrinking over time. Maybe there are other people who've come onto the, the land and used the wishing pool. Who knows? It could just be natural evaporation and, and you know, water loss. But it does have that impression that it is sort of a, has a finite quantity of wishes. But yeah, I mean, the, the pool itself, it's one of those things that like as i was reading it 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 made me start to question okay well how would i try to get around the pool's obvious i mean literalness but not even just literalness it it's it takes your wish literally but you have to be extraordinarily specific because i i went back to the place where in the story where natalie wishes for her parents to get divorced and her exact wish is please let my parents split up which as you said now the death of her father is splitting them up and and so my thought in any kind of story like this is always okay well how would i word this knowing that this is you know possibly going to backfire but i i think that's the the point of a story like this is that no matter how perfectly you articulate the wish there's always some sort of wiggle room or back door or or some way that it can go completely unpredictably wrong. And the more I, I think about that and that it, it just makes me think that it's it's almost like it's almost like a, a metaphor for life in a way, in that we can plan for everything possible. And there's still going to be something that comes that's unexpected, surprising, or just so unpredictable that you never would have thought. And I mean, you can almost relate that even to Joy's father and, and his condition when she sees him. It, it is kind of predictable living in a cabin for a year that has no heat and those sorts of things that he's going to be wasting away somewhat but also she did not know about his mental condition and, and so that even took her by surprise so i don't know i'm trying to draw a parallel here between that trying to plan for your wish and trying to articulate everything so succinctly and perfectly that the wishing pool doesn't screw you up 
and and give you something that you're not asking for and and her father and i don't, I don't know if that's a 100 percent connection that you can make but it's definitely i think a metaphor for like i said for for just living in general no matter how much you plan no matter how much you prepare something can and will go wrong or not even wrong but just unexpected can occur so there's my uh two cents on that <laughs> and i think also the idea that we're human beings and we wish we could wish away things and you can't and you know it, it's it's i don't want to say it's like a punishment but it's like showing you the real world like you can wish these things all day long but you don't know what's going to really happen or what you're going to get so i guess just don't trust wishing pools <laughs> Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Never trust wishing pools or, or wishes in general. Although sometimes they do have, you know, sometimes it's, it's more, it's a wonderful life where it's showing you that you, you can't see all the ways that you've uh, impacted something. But anyway, um, not all wishing away things are bad, but I think you're right. The idea of wishing away problems as opposed to actually dealing with them is uh, it's escapism and as easy as that can be that's not a healthy mechanism either i know we we had kind of discussed spoilers for the the book but uh, i'm sorry <laughs> the short story not the book uh i i know we had discussed spoilers but we've kind of gotten to the end of the story itself and I think we have all kind of agreed that we are going to leave a little bit of this for you all listeners to go seek out and read if you want the full ending. But I, I will say this, that Joy's a, attempt to to wish away her dad's infirmities, if you will, they meet with a kind of success, but it's definitely, it's that devil's bargain where she gets exactly what she asked for but it's not exactly the way that she asked for. And as I was saying, I, I think it is kind of a, in a sense, a form of, of escapism or, or at the very least, the, the fact that you can't have everything that you want and, and wish away the bad things in life. It's just not the way that life works. But I, I will leave the, the ending of the story a little bit vague as to specifically what happens. Suffice it to say, I think all three of us can agree that it really is kind of a a, a punch in the gut. It really does hit hard uh, when you when you get to the ending of the story, and it ends very abruptly almost, but it also ends in kind of the perfect place because you you see the exact outcome of joy's wish as an adult for for her father to be happy and healthy so if you listeners have read this or do read it based on our recommendation and have your own thoughts that you want to share with us we would love to hear from you we, we love hearing and interacting with you we're at no fear cast on twitter and instagram and we have a facebook page as well our email is nofearcast at gmail.com. And if you love what we're doing, do consider supporting us on Patreon. We have put a temporary pause on new mini episodes from the Patreon, but there are six seasons worth of older mini episodes for those of you who have not uh, donated to go back and work your way through. And quite honestly, some of my favorite things that we've done have been some of these mini episodes nothing against the, the main episodes either but i've had a lot of fun doing those mini episodes for the patreon as well but we totally understand if a financial donation is not something that you're capable of um, so if you want to help us out but can't afford it just rate and review us on whatever app you're using to listen to us that really does help other listeners find us and it really is an important thing for us. Our theme music is by Nicholas Gasparini, and we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.